Thanks for joining us on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. We're excited to have Martina and Leo from Cellular Revolution on this episode. Martina is the co-founder and chief scientific officer of Cellular Revolution Limited. She began her studies at the University of Ferrera in Italy, where she completed a BS in biotechnology and an MS in biomolecular and cellular sciences. Subsequently, she moved to Newcastle University, where she completed her PhD in corneal tissue engineering, and a significant part of this involved the development and technology underpinning cellular revolution. Following her successful PhD, Dr. Miyoto has focused firmly on a commercial career pathway. She initially received the Newcastle University Enterprise Scholarship, followed by the iCure Fellowship. Afterwards, she was awarded an Enterprise Fellowship by Royal Society of Edinburgh to receive mentoring and training in the business sector. Since the spin-out of Cellular Revolution from the university in 2019, Martina has led scientific development of the company. Leo Grunewagen is a co-founder and chief executive officer of Cellular Revolution. Leo has extensive experience in the field of biotech and pharmaceuticals. During his career, he has enabled a wide array of firms to outperform by achieving scientific, financial, and commercial excellence. As chief executive officer, Leo ensures that the overall goals of the company are achieved. Leo has previously held a position as CFO at a Swedish-based biotech company where besides financing, he was also responsible for investor relations, PR and communications, and business development. Some of his other experiences include positions at reputable consulting firms such as IMS Health and Deloitte. I'm really excited about this episode. Let's jump right in. Leo and Martina, thanks for joining us on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. Thank you, Alex. We're delighted to be part of the podcast today. We look forward to sort of explaining to the audience a bit more about our activities and what we're doing in the cultured meat space. So I want to really start off with your backgrounds. So tell us a little bit about your backgrounds and actually how you originally met as co-founders. So my background is actually not really in science, but more in business. So I got a educational background in international business and health economics. After that, I spent several years as a consultant for uh, large life science, pharma and biotech companies, working for aspects of market access, health economics and management consultancy, basically. Then I spent about two and a half years at a Swedish-based cell therapy company who are actually working on developing a cell-based off-the-shelf allergenic stem cell treatment for diabetes type 1. And then as part of a conference that was held, I think it was early 2019, that's actually where I met Jay. Jay Conan is our third co-founder besides Martina and myself. Um, we met at a conference, started chatting. He was discussing that he's starting with a spin-out or a pre-spin-out at that time called Cellular Revolution and that they were looking for a co-founder slash CEO. So then a few weeks later, after a bit of chatting and emails, I came down to the office in Newcastle, had some more meetings with both Martina and Jay, and then we decided that it would be a good idea to combine my business background with their sort of scientific expertise. Since then, it took us a few more months, say three, four months to sort of get really from idea to spin out completion, working on all the documentation with the university and some of our initial investors. And that's sort of how things got together. That's how I met the team, how I met Jay, Martina, and that's how we started our business. Okay. First of all, hello everyone and thanks again from my side for having us here, Alex. It's uh, been really a pleasure. So regarding my background, I did at the university in Italy, I moved in biotech in Ferrara in the north of Italy. So then I moved to Newcastle to do my PhD because I've been working in tissue engineering even before when I was in Italy during my bachelor and master. I was mainly in cartilage and bone tissue engineering. And then towards the end of my master, I started to work a bit in cornea tissue engineering as well. So actually, it's quite funny the story how I met Che, because towards, again, the end of my master, I was asked to attend uh, a summer school in Nottingham that was focused on cornea tissue engineering. And it was actually, you know, there. It was a week before I had my final examination and I was, you know, I I loved uh, research, working in a lab. So I was really looking forward to do a PhD still in tissue engineering. And it was actually at that meeting in Nottingham and I met Che. And then from there, you know, he said, I have actually uh, the possibility to have a, a scholarship available in January if you are willing in doing your, you know, a PhD abroad. So do some international experience as well. So I applied and I got very, very lucky. So I moved to Newcastle in 2015 
And then I finished my PhD in 2018. And I had, again, the possibility to work with Jay, to work in tissue engineering, to use a lot of molecules to functionalize tissues, mainly peptide-based molecules. And, you know, when I was kind of, let's say, playing uh, with these molecules, this new technology, this new application of these molecules came out and was from there that then we thought about the possibility of applying this technology in industry. And I guess the first thing, actually, that convinced us of the potential of the technology, even though we, we knew that before, was actually when we received the call from David, GFI, I said, you know, I've read your paper published in 2017. That would be, you know, great for companies that are active in the cultured meat space. And then kind of everything built up from there. And then so started to do a bit of market research, the possibility also in the UK, we have a lot of programs that do help scientists to get out from the lab and really do market research supported by Innovate UK, IQ program in particular. And then when we decided that it was a good idea that Cultured Meat and also other industries were interested in our technology, then we really decided to push it forward and then looking for a CEO that could help us in also building the business case. And that's how, you know, Leo already said how we met Che and then all the kind of the management team of the company build up from there. Interesting. Okay. And so in 2015 is when you met Jay Martina. And then Leo, when did you meet Jay at that conference? So for me, that was uh, early 2019. I see. Okay. And so Martina, Dr. David Welch from GFI reached out to you and Jay in 2017. And at that time, you and Jay were not specifically thinking about cell cultured meat applications. Well, the paper was published in November 2017. David contacted us, I think it was beginning of, I think it was like January 2018. And I think I can speak for Che as well, but from my side, I never heard about cultured meat before David reached us at that point. Interesting. Okay. So what's Che's background? Che is professor of tissue engineering here at Newcastle University. He has a background, I think his PhD is actually in physics, but mostly he always been focused on cornea research. This is actually going to be a very nice segue into our next question, which is about the university. But maybe we can actually step back a little bit and maybe you can give a brief overview about how your technologies do work in relation to cell cultured meat. Because I know that it also is relevant to cell therapies and biologics, but maybe give us an overview about how your technology technologies work in relation to cultured meat. Yeah, thank you very much, Alex. So our technology is based on this new class of molecules that are called the peptides. And we are developing at the moment two different products based on a proof of concept using cell type, fibroblast like adherent cell types in our lab before. So one application is what we observe that peptides are able to increase the proliferation of cells in serum-free media conditions. And we know how being able to culture cells in serum-free is very important. Again, not only for cultured meat companies, but in general for all industry, even for research. And then the other, which is actually our main technology, is a smart peptide that is able to continuously manufacture cells. So we are able to coat surfaces. Uh, adherent cells are sitting on top and continuously single cells are self-detaching from this coated surface at a steady state. So every cell that does self-detach does create an empty space ultimately for other cells to grow into. So the, the concept of continuous process is not new. It's been applied a long time ago, but mainly for downstream processes, for example, for purification steps. But no one actually thought about applying this concept so upstream in the process. So, for example, for the manufacture of cells. And we know that at the moment cells are manufactured in batches and every batch is actually limited to the surface that is available. In our case, the surface will not be a limiting factor anymore and you will be able to harvest cells continuously from this surface. And this does have ultimately a lot of advantages. For example, a reduction of footprint. So from our proof of concept, we know already that the footprint is going to be reduced almost 7,000 times. Then resources are normally reduced every time you switch from batch to continuous. We are talking about around 80% decrease in consumption of resources. Then because we have single cells that are self-detaching from our surface 
Another thing that we would like to do is to apply single cell QA into our system, meaning that every cell that is self-detached from the system and is collected before being collected can be screened. And if that cell has the correct phenotype or does meet the required parameters, can go to the next downstream process, otherwise can be discarded. And again, is another system that does work in serum free. So really it does have a lot of advantages. So what we are kind of doing now is collaborate with more companies as possible, in particular companies that are active in the cultured meat field, because as we know, we are, they are working with different cell types. And via these collaborations, we are able to validate and optimize our technology per each cell type. Interesting. Okay. And so this might be a little bit of an elementary question, but it seems like your process would actually be beneficial in both the research and development stage and then also in the future, the production stage. Is that correct? Exactly. That's correct. So it can basically be applied in any stage of the company. So whether you're doing your initial research in your laboratory or whether you're looking to really scale up your production facilities and set up sort of a manufacturing plant. And the earlier you sort of start working, I guess, with our technology, the easier the the implementation process will be. Okay, great. You know, there are many instances where biotech companies spin out of universities, and we've actually seen it with cultured meat companies before as well. What does this process typically look like? And how is it in the case of your company? To elaborate further on that, was it planned? Did it just happen? You mentioned that Che, who was originally thinking about the concept and idea based off his experience, he's a professor at Newcastle. So maybe tell us a little bit about how that process works. And then if you can, maybe a little bit also about how IP works when new investors come in, for example. I guess I can help you answer the first part, mainly of the question, Alex. So the university is very supportive in having spin-out companies. And from also the I talk for the scientist's point of view, I find it like it's the secret dream of each scientist to be able to not only develop something in the beginning and then publish a paper and then write in the conclusion, this technology would be amazing if it could be applied to. But I think the dream is to be able to drive that forward from the concept, from the R&D that is done in the lab, then be able really to take it forward and be able to design and develop your own product and be able to see that product being used by other people and be able to you know, make an impact, make a difference in the world. So I think from the scientist perspective, is a dream. I think I can talk for every scientist, probably. To the university, they are helping also the formation of these companies. Of course, they know that scientists generally, they don't have a business formation. So they actually suggest scientists to engage into these programs that I mentioned before. For example, again, I uh, participated to, to BioCity first, which gave us the possibility to do some training in business. Then I got another fellowship with iCure, which is another program that is sponsored by Innovate UK. So governmental fundings that are supporting of scientists able to validate their idea into the marketplace. And so the university is engaged, knows about the technology since the beginning. And then while doing these programs, is still engaged. So they are also aware about the outcome of this market research. And then again, the process falls into a committee that is called IPSO committee. The university looks at the business plan and a financial plan for the company. And if the university then agrees company could be successfully spun out of the university. The university is supportive also from the fact that it's able to provide some help using, still being able to use the university's facilities during the first years. So provide that bio-incubator for the company to form in the beginning. And then as a last, again, other programs that I'm actually doing at the moment, which has been amazing during the last year, which is another fellowship that is sponsored by the RSC, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, has sponsored these enterprise fellowships that are helping scientists or anyway people that they don't have a business background to help them in really form their new company. So we have been having training in business by great people during the last year. And I think this is another program that the university suggests and that we're really, really lucky to have in the UK. Yeah, so if you move a bit away from sort of the, the scientific aspects and the scientific relations of the university to the commercial one, 
it's a process, like Martina said, that involves a few steps that you need to go through. So basically, since I got started, we started a bit with initial communications in January, which actually started working on sort of creating a business plan, having discussions with Che and Martina, but also with potential investors. We needed to build a full sort of business plan in able to convince initial sort of seed investors and the university to say like, yes, this is something we can support. Uh, we think this company has viability and is addressing the right sort of market needs and has the right products and team to make it a success. So to make the spin out a success and to make whatever sort of IP your license, not a waste of license, but something they say like, okay, if we would keep it ourselves, it's not worth much, but if we would put it in this company, it will have much more potential in the future. It took a few months to get this entire business plan properly written down and agreed upon. Then we had a IPSOC committee meeting, which is sort of the committee for, for sort of the, the spin-out decision from the university point of view. So it's the intellectual property and spin-out committee. After they sort of granted approval, the next steps were sort of the creation of the formal investment documentation to agree with both the university, the founders, and the investor on sort of equity split and the investment made. And then, of course, it would also involve discussion with the lawyers from both sides to make sure that all the paperwork regarding company setup, share agreements, also the licensing agreements, for example, were all sort of properly documented and to make sure that, that as a company, it's in order. So that was definitely not an easy question, but you guys gave a beautiful answer. And I think from the science side, Martina, you're right. I think it really is a scientist's dream because when I tour universities and see their lab space, it's really top of the line compared to the traditional kind of startup bench you, you might see at, at some of these shared lab spaces. And then I guess on the investment side, Leo, like the fact that it is so buttoned up is actually very interesting to investors. And so that's super cool. And so we already talked about a little bit about your technology as it applies to cultured meat. But I, I want to ask, what are some of the other industries that your technology could benefit? Yeah, no problem. So cultured meat is sort of our initial sort of tier one market. So we are putting our focus on because... It is a brand new industry that has a lot of potential. And we also see it is relatively easier to get into a market where they are still planning and deciding to how to set up production than, for example, go to a cell therapy company that has already invested in technology and has capital invested in to say, you should change to a new production method, a new production facility. So that's the reason why we go into culture meat first. Technically, our technology can be applied to cell therapy companies, biologics, so basically any company working with cells can use our technology whether it's the coating or the bioreactor and you will see the same kind of benefits as you would see for a culture meat company you would say if you look at for example cell therapy companies moving to a continuous production process for example and would be especially interesting for future sort of allergenic therapies with large patient indications and maybe not so much for autologous therapies because you have a relatively different kind of economic model as a company but basically yeah we have Culture meat, cell therapies, biologics, biofactors, there's large potential market for us in all of the industries. If I was to ask, again, kind of like explain it like I'm five, right? Cell therapies. Can you tell me a, a very basic examples of like what cell therapies entails? Yeah, sure. So cell therapy is, in a very basic overview, is any type of medical treatment or potential medical treatment where you use stem cells, for example. So what's been in the news most lately are, for example, the CAR-T therapies uh, that has been launched sort of in, in 2019 in many countries across Europe and in the States. So, for example, if you take a autologous treatment, you use stem cells from a patient's own body, take them out of the body, send them to your production location, do your magic with it and, and sort of put them back into the patient. If you look at allogenic cell therapies, you would have a stem cell source, which is not from the patient itself, but could be from another patient or another kind of sort of source, where you would, for example, use uh, mesenchymal stem cells or, or different type of stem cells, adipose cells, to create a, a stem cell treatment. And that can be used for treating any kind of disease. Awesome. Thank you. That was great. So when it comes to cultured meat, we oftentimes hear that the major challenges are related to the cell culture media. But I wanted to just kind of ask you and Martina, what do you see as the challenge that will face the cultured meat industry in 2020 as the big challenge for this year? 
A few problems that are currently still in the industry are, for example, most of the companies working with culture meat are still using FBS in their production methods. It's small scale production, but still they're growing their cells, proliferating their cells using serum, which is still a hurdle they need to overcome towards future commercialization, basically. Another, of course, thing that is lacking or a problem of the industry is the lack of sort of cost effective manufacturing methods. So companies have been working on culture meat now for a few years and are thinking, how can we commercialize our product in the next few years? So they have to think, okay, how can we scale? And that's one of the major industry challenges, the scaling of the business and to, to make sure that you have a higher yield and at a proper price point that eventually a consumer could, could pay for. I think, as Leo said, Bobby, at the moment, we are still stuck with the early stage problems. So, for example, as Leo said, the use of serum and try to think about how to scale up later on, because as we know, there is a huge gap between the number of cells that had to be manufactured and the number of cells that we are currently able to produce. So the scaling up is definitely an issue. And actually, that's the main point where cellular evolution would like to help to come in and try to resolve this problem. But also, if I have to think about beyond, I think also about the efficiency of the process. So with new research also driven, thank you, by all these new startups, new fundings that are driving research, so be able to have new technologies, able to also increase the efficiency, for example, let's say the number of calories that are necessary to generate calories of meat. At the moment, the ratio, I guess, and I'm pretty sure is not very, you know, very good. Ideally, you should have input one calorie to then generate one calorie of meat. That would be the a dream. I don't think that's going to be ever possible, but of course, more research needs to be input into this. And then I also think a bit more about texture, because from what I read around is that most of the culture meat companies are, of course, starting with products that are, I don't want to say simple, because they are very difficult to make, I'm pretty sure. I don't want to simplify, but they are generally processed meat equivalent. For example, we know about the burger or other croquettes, or in general, where the, the, it's very difficult to be able to taste the, and emulate the texture of meat. I think later on, when all these companies will do an amazing job, they'll probably start thinking about what about a steak, a real piece of meat, a real cut of meat. And at that point, I think more research in texture will be definitely coming in. How can we have all our, you know, aligned muscle fibers and the good ratio of fat versus muscle? So I think that will also come in as well. And there is already, you know, research that has been done. For example, thinking about in our lab, we also have the privilege of having a postdoc that was funded by New Harvest, which will be the first postdoctoral fellow by New Harvest that is actually using curved surfaces to try to drive alignment of cells and so alignment than a more structured meat product. And then flavor as well. So, of course, the better we get the better product we want to get. So probably also more research in flavor in trying to have a taste that is as similar as possible to the animal-derived meat. And even besides that, of course, which is looking a bit more towards the future, is challenges we would have with potential sort of consumer and legislatory acceptance. Because of course you will see cultured meat. I mean, if you want to have your FDA or, or your European market authorization, you need to make sure that you do the research right you need to make sure you submit your data. You need to make sure that also you have a product that in the end customers will want to eat. So it's also an issue, but there's an issue for a bit further along in timelines for most companies at least. But we also have to keep in mind that it takes at least a year to sort of get through this regulatory pathway. Right. I think this is an interesting thing to consider is that there are startups that are claiming that 2021 or 2022 is the year that they will be releasing products. And, you know, Leo, when we were, I think, chatting at the International Conference on Cultured Meat in Maastricht, it was really funny because at that conference, a more science-heavy conference, folks would come up to me and say like, wow, it looks like we're another 10 plus years until we actually see this on the market. Whereas you go to maybe some other conferences and everyone is just so excited about the entrepreneurship of things and you hear things like 2021 or 2022 that people are thinking that it's going to be out there in one or two years in their supermarket like one-to-one with ground meat for example so what are your thoughts on the public release of cell cultured meats from a time perspective whether that's just a small and limited quantity or even large-scale distribution 
Yeah, thank you. So what I think is the first thing is there's a big difference in, like you say, what a scientist expects and what an entrepreneur would like to see. So as a scientist, you would normally look at the data that you have now. How would you see the development of a product? Generally, have a bit more cautious approach. As an entrepreneur leading a business, you sort of normally have a different mindset as to like, I want to push this forward towards the market and make this product available to the market as soon as technically possible. So you have a bit of a different mindset and look at things differently. So I currently see within the next sort of two, three years, you will see cultured meat commercially available, but that will be small scale. I mean, it takes a year to go through your approval process. In Europe or the States, I would expect to have cultured meat sort of available in very high-end restaurants or specialized shops, maybe around 2022. And I'm looking towards sort of the future. I mean... They have first the issue of scaling, making sure it's available to enough people. So you would look at, at commercial availability to the regular consumer, maybe in a supermarket, at least five years from now. Because until then, it is very unlikely that all the issues of first validating your product, then setting up your business processes, setting up your manufacturing plans, going through your regulatory approval, and then being able to produce enough quantities of product at the right price. It's something that is just going to take a few years. I think it's very difficult to give an answer to that question. It is an amazing question, but very difficult to answer. Also because the scientist point of view, I would say that there is still a lot of work to do. We all would like you know, to develop something that is already perfect, although I don't think that's going to be possible. I think there are going to be always products that are coming out that then will be refined over time as research progresses, as new technologies develop and they come in, they can improve the product or the efficiency or reduce the cost. That's also another important side when you're talking about you know, developing product for cultured meat. You're not talking about product for cell therapy where from a certain perspective they are not really looking at reducing costs but in our case the idea is to develop a product that needs to be price competitive with the cost of animal meat in that case you know a lot of research needs to be done a lot of time has to pass but on the other hand it's difficult to say because we really didn't thank you to all the huge investment that has been made in all these cultural companies, of course, the more investments you have, the more big teams you can have working on different projects at the same time. And so this really does accelerate the efficiency of the and be able to generate the product in the end. So, of course, we didn't need to thank all these investors that they believe in what cultured meat would like to achieve, as we believe as well. So we really need to say thank you. That will really accelerate the research and will probably be able to render cultured meat available as soon as possible. When that's going to be is a difficult question to answer again, but probably not before five years, five, ten years time, I would say. And then this five, ten, again, it depends on how much investment is coming in. And then if I can do just a quick observation of that I really like to think is that there are a lot of commonalities from a certain perspective, all this research that is coming in cultured meat and this idea that we need to generate a product that has a lower cost also make me think all this research, if we think about, for example, tissue engineering that is very similar can really apply to generate cultured meat constructs. On the other hand, if we are developing technology for cultured meat at a more affordable price, then we are also ultimately, then this technology can be used for medical applications as well and be able in the future, hopefully, to have therapies that are used for clinical use, but at a lower cost. And it will also have an impact on our health system as well. So I really like to think that also cultured meat is able to help in general other industries and also for the benefit of the health of everyone on this planet. Exactly. Like I would like to say, I mean, if it's up to us, cultured meat will be available now or a few years ago already. What we strive for as a company is to make sure that, that companies, by using our technology, for example, can get to market as soon as possible with a proper product that goes to all the right QA processes, which has a good cost price, has the right yield, and is a product that can come to market as soon as possible. So we're saying it can take a few years, but if it's up to us, it will be there now. We also know it takes a bit of time to develop a new product and to actually make it to commercialization. 
Yeah, and I guess we've seen the industry, or at least the amount of dollars invested in the industry, has pretty much doubled since the announcement of Memphis Meat's latest round of $160 million. And so do you think that we'll see another big investment in one of these companies, like, you know, mega size investment similar to the Memphis Meat's round? I mean, it's very likely. Most likely what you will see in the next year is several sort of smaller rounds of a few million dollars, anywhere between, say, five and, and 15 or something. But there will always be a few sort of outliers that will really like push forward and that have just, you know, the right investment case, just the right connections to get like this kind of huge kind of investment. On that note, actually, we are also going to raise a Series A this year. We will announce the exact details surrounding that in, in the next few months. And that will allow us as a company to sort of scale up our R&D efforts, our team, our facilities, so we can create better products, improve technology for culture meat companies to then do their scaling and their product development. Actually, on that note, would you be able to mention some of the details of your previously publicly announced seed funding? Yeah, so last year we had a seed funding round, which was completed around summer of last year, which was part of the whole spin-up process, which we went through. There we raised about £180,000, which is sufficient to last us basically one year to set up our production facilities, to set up the team, to grow the team, and to sort of create a potential product that we could commercialize later on. And that leads us then now to another round of proper Series A to be conducted around summer, mid to late 2020, basically. Okay, great. I want to take one of these last questions to ask, what are some of the ways that someone who's just starting to learn about the industry to get involved, either with your team specifically or with the industry in general? Well, Of course, we're always happy to engage with not just scientists, but people that are excited about what we do. And so, of course, they can always reach us either on the website or that is actually quite new, very nice. So on the website or LinkedIn, Solar Revolution does have a LinkedIn page. They can even write directly onto us on LinkedIn. We are always happy to answer. So being able to engage with people that are interested in what we do, also, for example, if they want to be part of the team, we're always happy to get in touch. And they need to be very excited, in my opinion, you know. They need to be very positive and like to work in a team. That's what I really look forward to. If, regarding the other side of the question, to get someone to get involved that is new in the space of cultured meat, I think there are a lot of, I'm not saying anything new, I guess, but, you know, it's always good, I think, to reinforce the message that there are a lot of organizations that can help with that. Again, New Harvest, GFI, and then even in the UK, we do have other organizations that are supporting Serum Agriculture, so CELAC uh, UK. So there are a lot of charities and organizations that are very happy in helping people that want to engage and be part of the community ultimately. Yeah, something I get is also just get involved by attend the first conference, go somewhere or just look online who are the speakers, what is being discussed and then reach out to them. I mean, most people in this industry, especially because it's a rather new industry, are still very much open to sort of collaborating with others, giving advice on what is the best way to find more information, where might there be a job opening. It's a relatively small industry. People know what's going on and everybody's so far pretty open in their activities. And then, I mean, there's tons of resources available online, like Martina already mentioned, podcasts like yours, of course. It's always a great source of information. And then reach out to us if there's anybody that wants to learn more about the industry or what they could potentially do within the industry, pop us a message and we're always happy to have a chat. Great. And Leo, you'll be actually in San Francisco at the end of the month for the Industrializing Cell-Based Meats Summit. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. So I'll be giving a talk about uh, industrializing cell-based meat and more specifically relating to continuous uh, cell manufacturing and then using the idea of our bioreactor to sort of explain how you can move from batch production to continuous production systems for cultured meat. Okay, cool. Yeah. And that conference, I believe, is coming up March 24th through 26th in San Francisco. So I definitely look forward to seeing you there. Yeah, so I I think it's one of these great examples, again, of opportunities where you can network with other people in the field. You can hear from other people's experiences and just a great way to sort of push forward a bit the culture meat field. You can learn more about Leo and Martina on LinkedIn or check out the website at cellularrevolution.co.uk. Leo and Martina, do you have any last insights for our listeners today? 
I would just like to thank everybody for listening. I think it's great to see that more and more people are listening to the podcast, are getting interested into the field of culture and meat. And I think it's really a product of the future. Like we said, it might be a few years away, but it is something that's going to happen. It is something that's going to develop. And there's basically no stopping cultured meat. Yeah. Martina, Leo, thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your story on the Future Food Show. This program was produced by H Media. We'll see you soon.